Welcome everybody. It's a great pleasure to see so many people here this Friday afternoon. Uh, my name is Carsten Jacobsen. I'm head of departments and uh, I'm dealing with Ola on a daily basis. Uh, and I'm very, very proud uh, to be able to invite Ole uh, to, uh, to uh, you to come and listen to Ole's uh, inaugural lecture as a professor in assessment of human exposure to air pollution. And I think that uh, we would do it uh, the way that, that Ole is giving uh, his lecture and then uh, he would either welcome questions during the talk or like them afterwards, so he would address that. And then, but then afterwards, uh, the Institute would like to be host for a small reception uh, afterwards. And if there's any informal words you would like to, uh, to connect to all, um, then it's, uh, it's at that location. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I will give the word to all. Thank you, Carsten, for the kind words. I believe I have a new record in this department. Um, it's in fact my third in order. <laughs> and, um, the first was when I was a junk professor at Ruskin University in 2009. And the second was here um, in the department when I was um, Professor MSO in 2014. And now as a full professor. I'm really happy to see so many people here. Um, I'm going to talk about um, a couple of different topics and I'll try to make some uh, breaks in between so you, you find uh, where we are swapping from one topic to another. Um, the first um, uh, topic I'll just initiate uh, will be um, to talk about use of uh, low-cost sensors in um, assessment of air, air pollution. And um, this is in fact a small device that you will uh, see later on. Uh, it's attached to my PC over there. Um, it's a particle counter. Um, it counts a particle number in 16 size spins from uh, 0.3 micrometer and up to 16 micrometer. And based on the number of particles in these size spins or size classes, it, it, we see here an estimate of uh, PM1, PM2.5 and PM10. So uh, particle mass, uh, particle mass in, um, in 0.1 micrometer uh, below 1 micrometer, below 2.5 <coughs> micrometer, and below 10 micrometer. We'll come back to um, so, uh, this um, device uh, later in the lecture. Uh, so we'll keep it running and uh, we'll see how much pollution is generated from the inaugural lecture here in this room. And I'll try to swap back to. Oops, it's moving around here. Like this. Ah, okay, yeah. <laughs> so before starting on the, um, the, the lecture itself, um, I have a number of acknowledgements I would like to give to uh, colleagues, to uh, my mentors in research and to my family. The first uh, slide I'm going to share will be very busy because it's listing a, a lot of names. It's um, some of those people that I've worked closely together with over the past years. Uh, I'm really proud and honored to have worked with so many great colleagues um, in uh, this department, in Denmark, Danish research institutes and, and abroad. I have a special acknowledgement to my two mentors in, in the research, um, Ruben Berkowitz and Einstein um, Hall, that uh, were my trainers in, uh, in, uh, in, in research. Been very important for my, uh, my research career. And then of course I would like to acknowledge my family and I'm very happy to have uh, many here. Um, this is a photo of my, these are photos of my wife and, and two kids we have. But then I'll, uh, I'll swap into um, to my inaugural lecture. Um, the first part will be um, an introduction. I'll say that um, what drives me in what I'm doing is a strong wish to, um, to make a difference uh, by what I'm doing and to contribute to sustainable development. I'm trying to obtain that from uh, working in, uh, in two research areas that it will be 
the, the key areas of my talk. Uh, human exposure assessment, so how much air pollution are people exposed to in, in the daily life, and then how is that linked to, uh, to health effects. And the second part is on uh, assessing atmospheric nitrogen deposition to, to nature and the impact that has on nature. Focus, no, sorry, I'll, yeah, okay. Before we uh, move into uh, to these uh, topics in, in more detail, I'll give some uh, uh, definitions. Air pollution is um, what is in the atmosphere and negatively affects human health or nature. And air pollution can be anthropogenic or it can be natural. Climate forces uh, are gases and particles that are escalating the greenhouse effect. And again, these can be anthropogenic or natural. My focus is on air pollution, but you will um, see that there is an inter interrelationship. Air pollution and climate change is, is linked. Is it interesting to, uh, to work with this area? Well, air pollution and climate forces affect climate, affect nature, and affect health. If we go back in the past, there was um, a saying, the solution to pollution is dilution, uh, that was a mantra. If you could just um, uh, lower the concentrations, we were certain that there would be no effect. Now we know that even at low concentrations, there could be effects both on health, nature, as well as on climate, uh, at lower concentrations. And that makes the uh, environmental issues more complex and means that uh, there's much more demand on environmental management and that's where we, we play a role in what we're doing. So let's uh, focus on, on air pollution um, and uh, what is actually the perspective in this. Um, we know from uh, assessments made by WHO that uh, 3.7 premature deaths every year can be associated with air, uh, air pollution. This is of course worldwide. If we go to, um, to Europe, about half a million premature deaths can be associated with pollution. This is a su substantial problem. There's actually a possibility of making a difference here. If we look at the um, impact on nature, well, 63% um, according to the EEA, the European Environment Agency's uh, assessments, 63% of the European ecosystems have exceedances uh, of critical loads. The ecosystems are under pressure. We have um, eutrophication limits exceeded. This means that we have too much nutrients coming into these ecosystems, and on the longer term, they'll swap into ecosystems with a lower bio biodiversity. I see it as an obligation and a privilege to take part in the um, public debate. Um, we. Um, we need to um, provide science-based consultancy and advisory, and we have to contribute to public awareness. This is an important um, part of our work. Uh, by the way, I, I just heard from Donald Trump. <laughs> we need to stay objective. We need to provide no fake news in what we're doing. And this is my point in, in this part. Let's uh, try to take an, an example of uh, public awareness. Uh, why is that important? Well, we know that the North Pole and South Pole ice caps are melting these years. We also know that when we walk around on a sunny day with an ice cream in our hand, that is also starting to melt. And sometimes we're more focused on the ice cream melting than we are on the ice caps on the North Pole and the South Pole. Reducing air pollution uh, reduces also climate forces uh, to a large extent. It's not always the case, but it's very often the case. We often hear about uh, carbon dioxide in, um, in climate forcing, um, but there's also what we call uh, short-lived climate forces, soot and, um, and methane. Well, we actually have a possibility on a, on a relatively moderate timescale to do something about it. 
So mitigation of climate change can in some cases also be mitigation of air pollution and vice versa. We can, we can reduce both, uh, both problems uh, by reducing uh, some of these um, constituents. Soot is actually one of the um, very important parameters in air pollution for, for health effects. Coming back to um, free and independent research and uh, the obligation to um, create awareness and contribute to the public debate, I, I, was, uh, I felt it as an honor to, part to participate in the March for Science and I was very happy to see uh, so many good colleagues attending uh, uh, this uh, demonstration. Uh, and I think it's, it's really a, a, an important statement we, um, we, um, we make by participating in this kind of events. But uh, it's crucial that we, uh, we don't neither <coughs> overstate or understate environmental issues and environmental problems. For, for a long time period, we, uh, I, I received calls from the public about um, air pollution issues, and the, the public perception was clearly that air pollution is increasing. It's an increasing problem that we're facing in the urban areas. And uh, some months ago, uh, we, we decided, colleagues and I, uh, to, write, um, um, to write an article um, uh, what about a feature, a feature article, um, to, to demonstrate what is actually the, the facts and the, the perspectives in air pollution and what is just myth and uh, how can we uh, obey those in, in, um, in, in, um, in making more awareness of this. Uh, the photo is, um, is from um, the TV, uh, the health magazine on the national TV where I participated um, uh, some weeks ago. Uh, discussing what is actually known about health effects of air pollution. Now I'll uh, yeah, maybe just wait here. Um, now I'll move into the first uh, research area that I've been working with, and that's uh, human exposure assessment. And uh, my my starting point in human exposure assessment was the um, development of the Operational Street Pollution Model, OSPM, uh, together with Ruben Berkowitz, first of all, but other colleagues have contributed to that work afterwards. This model is now applied in more than 25 countries around the world uh, and considered as a state-of-the-art model in assessment of um, urban uh, street pollution. Exposure assessment was initiated by um, um, the Danish Cancer Society, by Ole Oskar Nielsen, who is uh, actually a junk professor here in, in, in this department. He was making his PhD and he, was, um, he needed a tool to assess uh, exposure at uh, children's addresses in Denmark. And we applied uh, OSPM uh, after generating a lot of input data for these calculations. It was not a simple job to do. Um, and that moved us into um, assessment of air pollution. And one of those, one of the uh, key workers is uh, Matthias now, uh, continuing to, to develop this model. And has been uh, in our two PhDs working also on the further development of this uh, of this tool. <laughs> Over the, the years after this uh, Danish cancer uh, children cancer project. We, um, we made calculations for a number of cohorts uh, together in, in close cooperation with the people in, in my medicine and occupational medicine and uh, determined uh, relationships between air pollution exposure and uh, these various uh, endpoints, as it's called, different types of, um, of health effects. Uh, I think I uh, counted more than 50 papers that we have uh, contributed to uh, over the past uh, 25 years. These models have, or these uh, papers have considered a, a variety of health effects and a variety of cohorts. Um, and what has made it possible to make uh, unique contributions to the research in this area is the unique situation we have in Denmark. We have access to, um, to, to arrange the data, um, unique health data on, uh, on, on health um, outcomes but also unique data when it comes to input that can be used for uh, assessing the exposure at address level. We have uh, developed uh, from, from this uh, uh, more manual way of making calculations 
as things so like Jensen made his PhD on developing a GIS-based tool so we could make optimized, uh, aut yeah, optimized uh, calculations uh, for, for a large cohort. <laughs> In 2013, um, I was uh, uh, the first author on a, on a book chapter where we tried to summarize the studies we have been involved in until then. Uh, a press release made in connection with the release of the book uh, received uh, more than four and a half million hits within three weeks. That's a tremendous interest from the public, and it was, uh, by the way, uh, translated so to four different languages. There's a tremendous interest from, uh, from the public, not only in Denmark, but worldwide, for, the, for this research area. How do we actually carry out the um, exposure assessments? Well, we have two types of uh, uh, health effects we are looking at. We have short-term health effects that are associated with episodic events where pollution levels are increased uh, in, in a short period are, are sig significantly elevated. And for those studies, we have used uh, measurements. Um, the, the first photo up here is from the, the, the background station placed just uh, a few hundred meters from here at Risø. Uh, the second photo here is from the, um, uh, the roof of the HUS Institute at Copenhagen University where we are measuring the urban background levels. And then we have the hot spots in the traffic streets. This is a photo from H.C. Anderson Boulevard where we have a, a monitoring station in one of the most traffic streets in Copenhagen. The photo, uh, the lower photo is from um, um, an interview in, um, in um, the Danish TV, uh, national TV, when Oslo uh, decided that during episodes uh, they would um, abandon uh, diesel engines uh, in the city centre in order to lower the uh, pollution levels. Right now, Copenhagen uh, uh, environmental mayor is dis discussing uh, a similar um, uh, move in, in Copenhagen. Uh, I'm not sure that it will be possible, but it, it is a, it's a discussion, a debate at the moment. The other type of um, uh, health effects uh, are uh, related to long-term exposure. That could be exposure over a full lifetime or decades. <laughs> and for those uh, studies we have been involved in on the long-term exposure, like the Children's Cancer Project, we have, we have applied models because we don't have a time series of measurements that go further, uh, uh, far enough uh, back in time. Um, but, it, but it's also possible for us to make uh, fairly precise long-term estimates of exposure with the, model, uh, uh, with the model systems. And what you see here is um, some illustrations of the GIS-based system where we optimize generation of the input data necessary to apply the street pollution model. For this type of assessment, we are running uh, weather forecast models, um, combining that with a long-range transport model, linking that again to an urban uh, background model, describing the concentration in the urban background, and then down at the single addresses uh, using the street pollution model. As I said, um, in the following years after the Children's Cancer Party, we were involved in a, a numerous number of uh, exposure assessments. We have uh, been involved in studies looking at um, cardiovascular disease, uh, respiratory disease, uh, of diff with different types of endpoints, uh, both uh, hospital admissions and, and, uh, and death. Um, we've seen that uh, asthma admissions can be uh, associated with the, with the uh, pollution and wheezing among susceptible children, for instance. And numerous, and numerous studies in, in the short-term health effects where we've been using measurements uh, as the exposure proxy. And then on the long-term uh, studies, we see some, some of the same endpoints um, that uh, when you have long-term exposure, that can also be linked to cardiovascular disease, to, um, to um, respiratory disease, and uh, one of the, the, the more recent, and uh, cancer, of course, when you talk long term, uh, but even diabetes has been shown, and mechanisms have been described now uh, that uh, diabetes is linked to, to exposure to air pollution. Can we use these tools that we've developed for uh, uh, something else than uh, uh, determining the uh, uh, relationship between exposure and, and the health effects? Well, uh, we, we made a study, this was in connection with my higher doctoral degree in Copenhagen University. We made some calculations of um, 
what is the exposure when you commute from your address to your, to your workplace, when you, when you commute by bicycle, when you take the shortest route through the city, and, uh, and when you take a green route, a, a route where you avoid the most traffic streets, lower your exposure, how much would the difference be between these two uh, ways of going? And we've been uh, calculating for a full uh, work year, and we can see that uh, up to 30% reduction of uh, exposure could be obtained by providing a service, showing people what would be the greenest route, and without um, accepting more than 20% longer travel distance uh, for, for people. We have actually had many um, uh, requests for a service of this kind, but until now we haven't been able to um, to, uh, to find uh, the funding for, uh, for running uh, a system like this, a service like this. But there's definitely a big interest for it. Another area that we have been working on uh, for the past uh, 15, almost 20 years now, has been uh, uh, airborne allergens, uh, pollen and fungal spores. We know that 20% uh, of the population suffer from hay fever. We also know that hay fever is a mild form of asthma, it's directly linked to asthma. The current monitoring in Denmark is based on two stations, a very manual method where you collect pollen on a filter and you count the number of pollen and fungal spores in a microscope and you provide information to the public by averaging the data from these two stations. We know that uh, the um, local variation in pollen pressure and fungal spore pressure can be tremendous. So in reality, it doesn't make much sense to have two stations in average and, and give these as a general pressure of, on the population. The um, um, animation here is made by my colleagues uh, in, in connection with the PhD of Carsten Skjert, uh, Ambila Skjert, uh, together with, um, with Jesper Christensen and uh, Jörn Brandt where they, um, they made calculations uh, of uh, exposure to, um, to birch pollen uh, and using information about the position of uh, birch trees in Europe. This is a big job because you, you can find information from registers on uh, the number of uh, coniferous trees and, and um, uh, evergreens, uh, but uh, you, uh, you can't find information on specific uh, tree sorts like birch. Um, so it, it took a lot of uh, effort to, uh, to get information about that. We believe that as a reason to uh, upgrade this uh, research area to a similar level as we have in air quality, there are possibilities. Uh, maybe we should go for analysing the allergens directly instead of counting uh, the species. There are devices that make, make automised uh, counting of uh, fungal spores and pollen um, but they are expensive and, and they are not very precise. Uh, but we are, we are looking into this area and um, we have actually two ongoing PhDs. Um, Pierre of Erpe was looking at exposure to uh, pollen and ozone in combination. She has actually been looking at uh, exposure chamber studies, exposing people to this. And we have uh, Julia Olsen who is uh, looking at fungal spores for instance, uh, uh, fungal spores released in connection with the uh, harvesting on the fields in, in Denmark, is that related to, um, to allergen allergenic uh, reaction in the population? We believe that uh, the future is um, um, upgrading this area to, to, a, to a similar level as we have in air, air pollution. We've been uh, working on establishing a pollen research center. We have close cooperation with Asthma and Allergy Denmark. Uh, they are, they, they, this is an NGO, but they are responsible for the uh, monitoring of, uh, of airborne allergens in, in Denmark. We believe that the future is, some sort of, is in, in, in individualized uh, uh, warning, that we can go down on a much smaller scale than what is currently going on. So before I, I swap into my second uh, research area, I'll uh, try to uh, make um, a small summing up of the, of the first part. We, um, we see a tremendous interest from the public and from media concerning um, uh, air pollution exposure and, and associated health effects. 
We're using measurements uh, for short-term exposure assessments and model calculations for long-term exposure assessments. And we will go on with this type of studies. We are currently involved in a, a, a European-wide project, but funded by American uh, funds. Well, we're going to use the entire Danish population as cohort. So we're making calculations for every citizens in the country. We've seen that uh, various health effects are related to air pollution, and we find even stronger relationships for some of these studies compared to what has been found abroad. I believe that this is because of uh, access to unique health registers and unique data for the assessment of exposure. Currently, we're using the address as exposure proxy. That means we assume that the pollution level where people live is a proxy for what people are exposed to. Well, we know that people are not staying home when they're working, at least for, for most of them. Um, most people are commuting from their home to a workplace. They're commuting to institutions, to shopping centers, etc. Uh, we would like to move the exposure assessment and other step for, further, uh, getting information about time activity pattern and for those of you that followed the um, inaugural of uh, Clive uh, Sable uh, some weeks ago, there was some information about how uh, geographical tools and um, modern technology, mobile phone technology, for instance, can be used to obtain this type of information. So I believe that combining what we're doing with, uh, with work like what uh, Clive is doing and, and his uh, workers, uh, like Lauren, uh, we can actually obtain going to the next step of exposure assessment and maybe we can even make better relationships in the, in the future studies. We know that 20% of the population suffer from hay fever. We know that this is directly linked to, uh, to asthma and uh, we know that this research area or this monitoring that is done in this area is uh, uh, based on technology developed in the 1950s. So there's a big step forward to be done. Now, I'm um, swapping into uh, talking about atmospheric uh, nitrogen, and the, the focus here is on the reactive nitrogen compounds, um, so uh, nitrogen oxides and, and the reaction products from that, and ammonia and ammonium. Reactive nitrogen is produced in vast amounts by anthropogenic activities in the Haber Bosch um, process, where we are producing uh, nutrients from the uh, atmospheric nitrogen that has facilitated an intensification of, um, of agricultural activities worldwide. And in fact, 40% of the world's population is sustained by this process. If we move forward to 2050, it's believed that 3 billion people will be sustained by the Harbour Bosch process. It has been a, a tremendous uh, development and um, a step forward in, uh, in, in, uh, in the world to have the Harbour Bosch process. But we also know that when we apply um, 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 fertilizer, a substantial part of the fertilizer is, is lost to, to nature. Most of the nitrogen applied is actually released into the environment. And we know now that this has impact on the um, biodiversity in the local ecosystems. This is actually shown in a science paper. This is a science paper by uh, Stevens and co-workers from 2004, uh, where they, um, they, uh, they counted the number of species, plant and animal species, in different grasslands areas in, in the UK. Uh, and then they plotted the um, atmospheric nitrogen deposition uh, coming into the ecosystem and uh, towards the number of species. And you see this inverse relationship. Danish studies has, uh, have uh, confirmed uh, uh, the findings of Stephen and the co-workers. But the problem in, in the Danish studies uh, were that we could only get uh, pl plots or points for the curve uh, down in the high exposure part. We didn't have any ecosystems up in the low uh, exposure part. But we know now from, from this study, we didn't even see that there is a relationship that we lose biodiversity, we lose a uh, number of species when we get high nitrogen input. In fact, uh, the European Environment Agency, I already mentioned that in my introduction, 
the um, European Environment Agency has um, mapped the diseases of critical alerts for nitrogen over Europe. And you, what you see is for, for Denmark, uh, we, we have a very high load. Actually, it's so that even the background um, deposition, so the ecosystems, ecosystems, uh, the deposition you have when you are far away from local farms, even that is exceeding the critical loads for the most sensitive ecosystems. So we'll go on losing uh, biodiversity in the years to come, even though we are moving in the right direction, we are seeing a reduction of also the atmospheric nitrogen inputs. But what do we see in the uh, Danish uh, ecosystems? Well, for the, for the marine ecosystems, we, we see that we have eutrophication of the coastal waters almost every year. We have algal blooming, and these algal bloomings uh, are limited by, by nitrogen. This means that the more nitrogen you put in, the, the, the more growth you will have of algae. When these algae are blooming, uh, they, they die and they deposit at the bottom waters. And when they degrade in the bottom waters, we, we, uh, we have a, a consumption of the oxygen. And in the worst cases, we can have death of fish and, and benthic fauna, like you see in the, in the photo here. So we have what we call turnovers in the Danish coastal waters uh, in, in worst places almost every year. Estimates show that even though uh, there's been changes to the loads for the river runoffs and, and also for the atmospheric deposition, it's still approximately a third of the uh, inputs in the inner waters. Of course, when you, when you look at the very coastal waters like fjord systems, uh, the runoff is, uh, is uh, considerably uh, larger. But for the inner waters as a whole in Denmark, it's, it's around a third. We've been involved in a number of studies where we've been looking at the atmospheric deposition to um, some different marine uh, waters. And this was a study where we looked at um, the alerts of the Baltic Sea. It's somewhat old now. But um, the uh, points you see here, well, first of all, I should say the, the, the green line you see here, that's the um, development in, in uh, emissions, so what's released of uh, atmospheric nitrogen uh, to the atmosphere. And the point, points you see here, well, this is a, a model calculation we carried out. And these are estimates based on the different types of measurements. Um, there's still some work to do to, to make this better, but um, we, we believe that we have a fairly good uh, estimation of the atmospheric and oxygen deposition. We used the model of the system uh, at that time, it, it was a Lagrangian model that now has been taken over by the Danish Julian model, but uh, we, we used that to model the uh, gradients in atmospheric depositions. Uh, we can see that at that time it was ranging from something around 11 kilograms per hectare per year in the south, and uh, moving for, further north uh, we were going down to, to around 2 kilograms. There's a gradient in this going from, uh, from south to north uh, due to the um, transport of, um, of pollution from, um, from the Central Europe. Then moving to the terrestrial ecosystems, um, we have made assessment with a system we call the uh, DAMAS system, Danish Ammonia Modeling System. We are combining the long-range transport model by a deposition version of, uh, of OML, the OML depth that Peter uh, Trump developed. Uh, so we can assess the uh, local deposition from each farmhouse uh, around that farm, and very locally the deposition can actually be very, very substantial. We can see depositions even up to 30, 40 uh, kilograms per hectare per year in, in the, in the near, nearby uh, surroundings. We, uh, we made an assessment for uh, the environment center Aarhus, where they asked us to, to make calculations for the most sensitive ecosystems they have in, the, in their domain. Um, I haven't shown the name here, uh, names here because you wouldn't be able to, to gain much from, from the information of all these different ecosystem names. But um, what, you, what you can see here in, in this uh, figure is just uh, the results from all these different ecosystems where the um, um, the, the, this bar that you see over here, the over one, upper one here is the upper limit to critical loads. What is the, um, what is, from research, 
what is the maximum nitrogen deposition that this ecosystem can, can, uh, can take before it, it changes into another ecosystem. Um, and from, from studies, there's a range in these uh, critical loads. So the, the lowest we have found in, in, in literature, lower limit for, for critical load, is, is the uh, lower part of the bar. And the dot up here is what we have found from the Danish calculation, uh, the, uh, the atmospheric nitrogen deposition for that ecosystem. And this is on an annual basis. So when you see, when you, when you look through all these different calculations, you can see that for most of the ecosystems, uh, or for all the ecosystems in, in this domain, we have either exceedances of even the higher, uh, uh, um, uh, higher um, critical load limit, upper uh, critical load limit, or we are between the two. Um, so we, we believe that all these ecosystems are more or less under pressure and uh, that we will, we, we do risk to, uh, to lose biodiversity in, in, the, in the near future. We have tried recently uh, to try to, uh, to, to combine the two research areas that I've been working in. Uh, I've been looking at human exposure assessment and the, in uh, the Danish project, um, uh, research council project, we are, we are now looking at health effects from um, from uh, atmospheric nitrogen compounds. And this came out because uh, some of the model calculations uh, indicated that ag agriculture contributes significantly to, to particle mass. And particle mass is believed to be the most important uh, part of uh, air pollution for, for health effects. Then we were wondering, is there actually a, a health effect of agricultural nitrogen? And in fact, we are, uh, one of these days, we'll submit this paper. Uh, well, we seem to find uh, an association between uh, ammonia and ammonium from uh, agriculture and the risk of developing uh, asthma. It's not published, uh, it's not submitted, but it will be submitted within a few days. The, uh, what you see else in, in this slide is uh, a number of the papers we've been involved in. Um, and I was um, editing a, a book chapter on the European nitrogen assessment, uh, a huge book that summarized what we know about uh, atmospheric, ni uh, atmospheric nitrogen and, and the impact on, on, on nature. Um, and I was uh, uh, summarizing what we know about the processes governing the reactive nitrogen compounds. So just before moving into the last part of my lecture, that will be on the um, on the uh, low cost sensor and sensors and how we can apply these in, in, um, in research um, on atmospheric uh, nitrogen assessment. I'll sum up what we've, we've found in the atmospheric nitrogen deposition part. We've seen from uh, literature that uh, biodiversity decreases with increasing nitrogen input. We know that in Denmark the intensive agriculture means high nitrogen loadings. The terrestrial ecosystems, well, in general, we have exceedances of uh, a vast majority of the ecosystems in Denmark, of the sensitive ecosystems, uh, of the critical lo levels. For the marine ecosystems, we have these algal blooming's. We know that uh, runoff is, uh, is the main part, but atmospheric deposition contributes significantly to the loadings. And then we have started looking into a new research area, and we are just about to publish some of the results of looking at the health effects of agricultural nitrogen. So now moving into the last part of my, uh, my inaugural. Um, low cost sensors, that is devices that you can obtain at a low cost um, and for that reason, you can apply vast numbers of, of uh, these instruments compared to what we can do in, in the conventional uh, air pollution monitoring and, and measurement. They have to be easy to operate and of low weight if you, uh, if you want to use them for personal monitoring, for instance, and, and that's generally the case for these. They are not going to substitute um, air pollution monitoring, even though many uh, companies currently are claiming that there are some possibilities in that direction. But they can be uh, an important supplement. The fact that we can uh, obtain a, a large number of these devices means that we can have a high geograph geographical 
uh, resolution in the, in, the, in the data. We also know that um, they, they do have high uncertainties and uh, in some cases we can overcome that, but we have to find the right compromise between the um, cheap devices and the quality of data. We can overcome to some extent the uh, low quality when we have a, a vast number of, uh, of monitors and, and, uh, and a lot of data and we have a reference point when we compare to, for instance, routine monitoring uh, stations. We know that these uh, monitors, they can, uh, these low-cost instruments, they can be uh, very illustrative in, uh, in teaching and also in attracting attention to uh, atmospheric uh, sorry, air pollution issues. And, and we, are, we are trying to move into that direction as well, uh, trying to make uh, teaching kits, for instance, um, to be used by school classes in public school or in high schools. Uh, for, um, for attracting uh, interest, but also to, to generate awareness among the children. This is a way to get awareness of uh, environmental issues. We would like to use these instruments in, in our assessment of exposure to air pollution. Uh, maybe they could be used for, uh, as a screening tool in Woodstow areas. We get a lot of phone calls from uh, people living in a, in a neighborhood uh, with a lot of uh, wood stoves that are highly annoyed by the pollution from the neighbor. Um, and maybe with the low-cost instruments, we can go out and get an idea, is the pollution here actually at a level where it, where it might be an, an issue that should be pursued. We can also use them to study exposure in urban environments. Uh, there was a, a citizen science project funded by the EU where, for instance, in, in, in Oslo, they had a vast number of uh, stationary stations based on low-cost instruments, uh, and they combined models and calculations with these uh, measurements uh, to map the pollution levels with high detail. We could do this kind of study, but we could also use them to test the exposure modeling we're doing. And uh, with OSPM and, and similar tools, we can actually track people along the route uh, and, uh, and we can compare what we obtain from these uh, models uh, with what we obtain from the machines. At the moment, uh, the operational street pollution model has mainly been validated for the uh, classic street canyon uh, situation. When we have buildings, high tall buildings on both sides of the street, um, and we have less data from streets with the buildings only on one side or with big differences in, in building height on the two, two sides of the street. Low-cost instruments could make it possible for us to perform um, detailed mapping and compare that to what we obtain from the, from the model. Maybe we can use these tools in the future to, um, to validate all exposure assessments. That is at least an attempt we will try to pursue. What you see on the, on the photo down here, the, these two, these are from a, a, a commercial device. Unfortunately, the company went bankrupt and they were not able to sell sufficient number of, of instruments. But the, um, but the small um, uh, container for the device, we, we've been in contact with a company that produces that. And we can actually make these uh, uh, low-cost instruments in a, at a size where we can put them in here, uh, where the electrochemical sensors can actually fit into such a small box. And they can be uh, commu uh, communicating with a, a mobile phone and transfer over the mobile net, so we can get online data, we can have online display of data, uh, like you see on, on the phone here. Um, so there are some possibilities in, in that direction. Currently, we are testing uh, a number of devices besides the one that I started monitoring with in the beginning of my lecture. So, uh, just to show a couple of examples here, the, uh, uh, the device is up here, that's actually the device that I started uh, in the beginning of my lecture. It's um, a particle uh, counter uh, that counts in these 16 size bins. Um, the price is around 2,000 kroner when you buy one, but I'm sure if we buy, buy a vast amount, we can live at least half the, the cost of these devices. Um, so they're not that expensive. 
the um, camps seem to be reasonably good. Uh, there have been a number of groups that have tested them, and we are we're testing, testing them right now. We've actually bought five instruments just to get some idea of how well they work. At the lower part of this uh, uh, slide, you see um, electrochemical sensors. Um, we've tested um, sensors for nitrogen dioxide and ozone, and they, they seem to work fairly well. The problem is that there's a lot of individual variability in the sensors. They have to be calibrated instrument by, or sensor by sensor um, in order to ensure that they're giving good data. And we know that they may even drift um, during use. They have a lifetime of something like two to three years. Um, then they have to be substituted. But we're testing them and um, we're seeing this type of devices being applied uh, a number of places. Um, in, currently we have a project for, um, for the um, Innovation Foundation where we're testing devices um, applied by a small company in Copenhagen uh, called Leadcraft. Um, these devices, uh, you can see them here in, in supercations. So the, um, so the right you have the device next to our monitoring station in H.C. Anderson's Boulevard and to the left you have a device um, that is um, or a, a box, a sensor box that is uh, placed just a few hundred meter, meters away but um, behind the city hall of Copenhagen uh, um, municipality. In a press release um, some months ago, um, it was stated that it's really scary that um, in, in a place like behind the city hall, you can find levels that are uh, substantially higher than what you find in H.E. Anderson's Boulevard. And we were quite puzzled about that, and we, we, uh, we believe now, after having looked at the um, locations and having tested the devices, that this is simply a, a matter of the uncertainty of the devices. I went in dialogue with the municipality, and um, we, we still are trying to find the time for, uh, for a meeting where we discuss what can you actually obtain from these instruments and what can you not. Um, it is a, a very important job for us to, um, to take part in this, so we don't see a lot of data out there that is being overinterpreted. We we'll still see some um, great uh, possibilities in this. And this, uh, just before I, um, I get to the summary of my lecture, let me um, just turn back to the uh, device that, um, that I initiated in the beginning of the lecture. We'll see whether I've been polluting a lot up here. Oh, well, actually, the uh, PM10, uh, the, uh, the uh, more coarse um, particles, they have been decreasing during the lecture here. I don't know exactly why. Uh, <laughs> you can see that the uh, fine fraction particles, PM, PM1 and PM2.5, particle mass of particles less than one and two and a half micron is slightly increasing, but the, but the levels are fairly low. I should say that uh, this device cannot count the particles less than 0.3 micrometers. That means that we cannot, for instance, see direct emissions uh, from the vehicles and streets and so on. Um, so these are slightly aged when we, when we count them. But for the mass, these very, very tiny particles, they do not play so big, a bigger role. So probably this is not too bad as an estimate of the uh, particle. Oh, uh, something happened? No, <laughs> okay. Um, probably this is not too bad as an estimate of the um, particle uh, levels uh, when it comes to mass. Okay, then uh, I'll just move back to my... Uh, Summary. So the, summary. the key points uh, from my lecture today uh, is that um, I consider public, uh, taking part in public debate uh, as a privilege and uh, an obligation. It has to be science-based, it, it cannot be fake news. Evolution has severe effects on health and on environment. Um, but there's still a need for improving the tools and methods we are applying in exposure assessment. Uh, and I see some possibilities in these local sensors and combining that with what can be done in geographical modeling, for instance, and what can be obtained from air quality modeling and from uh, linking that up to what we obtain from the routine monitoring. So low-cost sensors, low-cost devices can add some new information, and I believe that that's possible. We see a lot of companies that are moving into this area. Besides this Leapcraft company I mentioned earlier, we have been contacted by two students that have just built a company in Aarhus, 
and they have managed to get funding for um, applying 50 devices in different locations in Aarhus. They have never made measurements before, they don't know what to expect. Um, they have not uh, compared this to, uh, to what has been measured in, in routine monitoring, for instance, but we are trying to, um, to guide them in, in this direction. There is there a need for research and science-based advice and consultancy, and I'm, I believe that we, um, we can make a significant contribution to this. And let me just uh, conclude my lecture by quoting the French president, uh, Macron, that recently said, let's make our planet great again. Thank you. Thank you. of uh, asthma and COPD patients that could clean the air. If you're very sick with asthma or, or chronic obstructive airway, airway disease, you're probably not that much in the street. But you're in your home uh, and um, could you do something to clean the air, not the cigarette smoke, but the air? So the question I received was uh, whether there's a way to clean the air from uh, fungal spores and, uh, and pollen in the, in the home of citizens that are susceptible to, um, to exposure. Uh, some years ago, uh, the group that um, we have two colleagues from Copenhagen University from the uh, Department of, um, of, of Health um, um, Science, they, they, made, they made some studies um, about 15, 20 years ago where they were they using HEPA filters to clean rooms at elderly people's uh, homes. Um, and they could see that um, uh, when you clean the air, um, and then you open, uh, you, you stop the cleaning for, for six hours. Um, then you compare the blood circulation in, in the extremities in the arm uh, before and after uh, letting just outside air enter the room. Uh, it changes actually the blood circulation in the arm of these elderly people. So if you can you can buy, for instance, the uh, HEPA fillers. You can clean the air. Uh, I guess it would be relatively expensive to do that, but but it is possible to do. But hospital admissions. Better than a hospital admission, for sure, yes. That is also very, very expensive and a big um, load on the patient. Other questions, yes? If you're looking at the nitrogen pollution from uh, farming, can you already now see if there's a difference using organic farming compared to what you can call uh, traditional farming? So the question was whether there's a difference between uh, organic farming and traditional farming in the uh, nitrogen releases. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, if you let uh, pigs and, and uh, cows go outside, you have actually higher emissions than uh, what you can get from the, uh, from, from the farmhouses. Uh, because from the farmhouses you have the possibility of, of uh, removing the manure. Um, whereas the manure will just drop on the, on the, on the ground when they're, when they're out there. Uh, so it, it's not always that organic farming is a uh, better solution that way around. Uh, it's more of a, when it comes to pesticides and, and spreading, uh, yeah, spreading pesticides in general. Yes? Yeah, uh, when we're talking about this uh, with the, the ammonia, what about uh, organic amines? Uh, you, you had this where you could see a correlation between uh, ammonia and uh, uh, health effects. But what about organic, organic amines? They're both very strong in party formation, but they can also be transformed to, to nitroamines, which are carcinogenic. Is that something that's on, on the agenda? So the question is whether we, uh, we have some uh, projects coming up on looking at health effects of amines. I, I don't have any projects uh, at the moment in, in the pipeline. Um, there's definitely a possibility, a, a, a potential, you say, uh, especially since amines uh, might be used in the, in the carbon sequestration in, in the future. But, but, yeah. They also emitted from agriculture. They also emitted from agriculture. We, we don't have data for it at the moment, but uh, yeah, there's definitely some possibilities. Trial. Be a little bit here. Uh -huh. um, the last 30 or 40 years, um, major funding agencies have spent a lot of money 
I mean, our work on looking at the health impacts of air pollution. And many people suggest that we're not making anything, uh, we're not making an incremental step in science. Mm. So what do you think should or could be the next big breakthrough in, in uh, health impacts of air pollution? Or do you think that agencies should focus their funds elsewhere? <laughs> So the question is whether we are actually just spending money on research that doesn't have an impact on the, the real environmental issues and solving some of the health issues especially. That's a good question. I think in, in general awareness of the area is important. You know, I've talked a lot about that in my lecture today. Um, and I believe that when we um, attract more attention to the area, it's more likely that we're actually moving forward in the right direction. We do see um, a significant improvement in air quality in these years. Air pollution levels have decreased substantially in, in recent years due to various types of um, 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 abatement um, strategies and so on. And I think we, will, I know that we are going to see that continue. What I would like to see is, for instance, um, even stronger moves in the right direction. And we've seen that the government finally has decided to, uh, to lower the, um, the tax on the electric um, vehicles um, just recently. But in Norway, for instance, they have um, gone far longer than what we're doing here, um, lower the, um, the, um, the tax uh, to, I don't know if it, it's even zero, but it's very, very low. It is zero. And it's zero, yeah. Uh, and we see that it's, it's almost half of the car sales now that is electric uh, in vehicles in, in Norway. So they're moving very fast in this area. And that would help a lot on the, um, in the air quality in cities. Just as an example. Other questions? Yes? I'm uh, sorry. No, it's, uh, Sarah? It's such a science nerd question, but the, the microscale counters. What technology are they using that they can be so cheap? The, uh, the device that I'm uh, running at the moment, uh, just on the background, is, um, is just a small laser. The difference between uh, what is done in this uh, device and what we're doing in, in the high cost uh, devices is that we, we don't grow the particles to a larger size. So we, we, we don't measure the, uh, the smallest uh, particles, we don't count the smallest particles. That's why it, it has a cutoff around 0.3 micrograms, uh, micrometer in, in size. Um, but but it, it is a simple and, and cheap laser. They've been able to produce that at a very low cost at the AlphaSense, it's, it's a, a UK-based company. Um, and uh, what we're seeing from, uh, from tests uh, at various uh, research institutes these years is that they, they seem actually to be pretty good. Um, but uh, we, we don't have experience from them yet. Uh, I received uh, these five devices just two weeks ago, and uh, yeah, I just found it was funny just to, to apply it and see how it, it, it develops in, in the room here. That's a very good question and it's something we're going to, to test, but what we will see is that when the, when the humidity is high, <laughs> then the tiniest um, particles will grow, and that means that we will have more um, coming into um, PM1 and PM2.5, um, so it will definitely affect the measurements, but I mean, the, the device cannot respond to it, it, it can just count what it, what it sees. Peter? What is the difference between roll mean PM10 and PM10? It, it's a rolling, rolling mean, so it's averaged over some time. Um, so um, you, you um, yeah, I, I haven't, I haven't studied the instrument in much detail, but but it's it's it's, it's a running mean over maybe an hour or something like that. So it should be averaged um, a little more than what you get from these single um, single data. In fact, you can um, you can also be looking at what it's counting. Well, what is counting uh, uh, right a second? Let's see if we can move here. Yeah, yeah. This is directly the uh, number of particles per milliliter. I don't know why they have used this um, 
uh, volume, but uh, it's the number of counts per milliliter in, in different size uh, pins. So that's another way to look at the data. You can store data on a PC, um, lock the data, all these counts, uh, second by second. <laughs> that, that's a lot of data. Um, you can also um, aggregate um, PM1, PM2.5, and PM10. And if you don't operate it on a PC, it, it can store the data on an SD card that is actually inside the instrument. But then you don't get any of the other information. You only get this uh, aggregated uh, data set. Another device that I got from a, a German company, uh, AMS, that is a, a tiny USB key that you just plug into your PC and it measures uh, volatile organic compounds. Uh, that is also an electrochemical sensor, like uh, the ones from AlphaSense. I have no idea of the quality, but it, but it, it gives some fun data to look at. Um, and it, it's just the size, so it, you can really well, carry it around in your pocket. More questions? Yes? yes. Could they uh, be more specific and uh, count a specific class of, for instance, organic particles? So they could be used for counting points? This instrument is intended to be uh, very cheap and, and uh, simple. Uh, it's, it's only a laser, and it's only just counting the number of particles uh, uh, per volume. So that, this, this instrument cannot provide this kind of information. But there are other instruments, of course, that can do it, but they wouldn't be so easy to carry around. Thomas? Are they really so cheap if you, I mean, the calibration that you have to carry out routinely, if you count the man out there, are they then so much cheaper than what we all normally are doing? So the question was whether it is really a cheap instrument when you take into account the labor that you have to use in testing and calibrating the instruments. That's a good question. Um, this is something we have to find out. We'll have to find out what is the procedures necessary in order to operate them, how, uh, how, intensified, uh, or how intensive uh, labor is that uh, demanding. We, we don't know yet. Um, we, um, we seem to get a project in, in UK uh, in, in, the, yeah, in the Thames, uh, in, the south, uh, in the south end, where uh, maybe 50 instruments will be applied in, the, in a small city. Um, and uh, well, we, we are to, to calibrate and test the instruments, so we need to develop some procedures for doing this quick and, uh, and not to, too labor intensive. Uh, I can't say how we'll carry that out yet. But it's a good question. Any more questions? Okay, then I'll just say thank you and then we'll go to the reception.